Okay, so once again, welcome to the Zodiac Lounge. Uh, for those of you who don't know what it is or was, it was the name of a store that I ran for 11 years on the Upper West Side. Metaphysical store by day, but it was a speakeasy by night where really interesting people, a lot of New York psychics, witches, mediums, everybody, other store owners, interesting people, some celebrities, uh, we get together and have some really interesting discussions about a lot of things, some of them a little on the heavy side, like tonight's material is going to be. Um, and sometimes it was just like a knockdown drag out party, including a couple of brawls, which were fun with me. Uh, but tonight's subject is um, it's about the ability to manifest in our everyday lives, to be able to create in the quantum and have it manifest in our physical world. And um, you know, a lot of the stories that we were brought up understanding and believing, um, and please forgive me if I seem distracted, my co-host wingman slash tech support wizard is out of the country until mid-September, so I'm going to be doing every damn thing myself, including letting people in, keeping an eye on chat, probably losing my mind um here's more people coming that's great i'm glad we're all coming in. <laughs> and i'm glad i'm getting totally distracted and knocked off my swerve but i don't care because it's fun and tonight i'm really encouraging um as much feedback uh as you guys want to present this is meant to be a round table discussion i will start off with a couple of topics uh, it's very similar to the classes that I present when I'm teaching any ancient traditions. And of course, I'm looking at um, I'm looking at my participants. I don't know what's going on with everybody. All right, fine. You know what? If you can't, if you need to get a hold of me for any questions, uh, write them in chat. Consider that speaking out loud. I set the presets to mute everybody's mic upon entering and um, another user coming in. And I will ask you to unmute if you, um, if you have any questions or if you want. If you do have questions, the best thing to do is go to the bottom of your screen or, I mean, I'm on a desktop computer, so it's in the bottom of my screen. I don't know what it's like if you're on a tablet. I'm looking at Scott Wass's fabulous cat. It's the most beautiful cat I've ever seen. <laughs> Sorry, guys, don't get jealous. My two boys are out of their minds now. Um, so use the raise hand function. If you do have to quite have a question or if you would like to come on screen, because um, I would love to share the screen with anybody who wants to to join in this. Uh, it's a lot of heady material. Uh, it's when I present this in public, I give everybody this essay to read uh, as homework by Julian James, and I'll get into who he is in a little while. But the whole premise is that. Um, and Keisha, I see your message. You can help for the next show. Fine. If I can figure out how to add you on to do it, I will, because this isn't my Zoom account. This is Scott Harney's Zoom account. And I don't know what privileges I have or what privileges I don't have. So we're going to have to roll with that. Um, but um, I usually start off the lecture on this concept because it's in two of my classes, my tarot class my tarot workshop series and also my class on creative visualization and meditation because it really helps explain the steps we have to go through the physical phenomena that are needed to be employed in order to access uh, a space of timelessness where there's no past present future there's just us and our topic or issue and we actually work with it uh, and I'm going to bring you through a path working uh, a guided path working meditation or mini meditation later because I don't want to blow the whole thing. It gets really, really intense. Um, but I always start out with the question, why do you think there were so many, you know, why were there so many miracles in biblical times and we have jack shit right now? Um, and the answer has to do with 
you know, well, biblical times. Let's take where our information is coming from. It's coming from the Bible. And I am not um, challenging the Bible. It is a very valid book. I believe it was a code of behavior that was brought to us uh, through oral tradition before writing was developed. But before writing, there were pictures. There were paintings. There were cave paintings going back millions and millions tens, maybe hundreds of millions of years in an effort to communicate. So it's really all about communicating with each other in a way that is saved for lessons for people to learn about in the future. It could be a code of behavior, a code of ethics that was passed down from our earliest societies between the Tigris and the Euphrates. But let us not forget that the parables in the Bible were pretty much metaphor and allegory. And I'm going to pick one in particular that I really like because it has to do with miracles and and how to interpret what exactly is a miracle, what is capable. It doesn't mean that you can get, I see another great cat in, in our Zoom window. Keisha has a cool cat too that looks an awful, well, a little bit like Scott's cat. That's very nice. So you guys just lay there like logs. So... Um, talking about Moses, all right, Moses, particularly when he was mentioned in the book of Exodus, when he had that big bitch fight with the Pharaoh, and um, he threw his staff on the ground, and it turned into a cobra, and devoured all of Pharaoh's cobras. Well, if there was a way to do that, and you can figure it out, I'm going to give you a little life hack, little pro tip. Do not create a cobra unless you have a pet mongoose because i have been to egypt i have met cobras and they will mess you up they will completely destroy you so the metaphor serpents an ancient metaphor or allegory were a symbol of arcane wisdom esoteric wisdom so now think about who moses was we know he was a jew because we got the backstory from reading the bible but when this event happened when he challenged the pharaoh about his people who were building the pyramids he was thought to be the son or the favorite of the pharaoh he was thought to be egyptian so the public perception and it's really important that we talk about public perception in ancient times and how it may or may not be retained or accessed by us now in some memory bank. Um, Most people knew that uh, or believed that Moses. Hello. Why am I hearing? Okay, I'm muting. Yes, Dana, I hear you and I just muted you. (laughs) Why? um, Why do I need to bring this up? Most people perceived that Moses was the favorite of the Pharaoh. He had a very high position there. Everybody knew him. In that time, the temples, the high priests and priestesses were pretty much the ruling class, a lot like our politicians are today. They had everything to do with the economy. The economy ran on donations made to the temples and then the temples sustained themselves. They brought food. They brought everything, education, everything to the people of Egypt. And everybody knew who the higher ups were. So Moses was no shrinking violet and he was no random guy. Uh, He was very high profile, very well known. So what it seems to me is that the parable of the staff and the serpent, Moses' staff turning into the serpent, and then Pharaoh threw some staff that and turned them into serpents, and then Moses' serpent consumed all the other serpents. If a serpent was representative of divine wisdom in ancient art or esoteric wisdom in ancient art, this was a philosophical argument between Moses and the Pharaoh And it had to do, I believe, with freedom, because that period of Egyptian history happened shortly after, when I say shortly, we're talking about a couple of millennia after the Bronze Age, which started in 4700 BC, I believe. So it wasn't really, it may be a few centuries after the beginning of the Bronze Age. Prior to the Bronze Age, the world was ruled by the divine feminine. It was mostly high priestesses, queens, queens. elevated females who were there as nurturers healers teachers all of those wonderful things they were associated with the moon of course they were thought to be mystical too because they when they were menstruating it went along lunar cycle so that was the connection and the moon was thought to be the goddess in the sky the reflection of the sun 
uh, who was considered the divine masculine. But then when the Bronze Age occurred, we learned how to do one thing. We learned how to make more durable weapons. And that was really important because bronze was superior to any other metal used prior. So if you have more durable weapons and your societies are becoming more and more complex and more and more advanced and more and more numerous in particular, they're going to need greater management or better management. And that is going to occur um, by militarizing the society. So now all of a sudden, the religious, the clerics were no longer in charge, the military was, and it was a whole different philosophy. And as we know from later parables in the Bible, especially as we get toward the New Testament, uh, in the story of Jesus of Nazareth and that whole crazy thing that happened with Herod and Pontius Pilate and everything else. Nobody wanted to get their hands dirty. But there was a lot of quid pro quo going on be behind the scenes. So I don't think that Pharaoh and the high priest and high priestesses of the temples and the military, because they had Egypt had a great military at that time, were all working hand in hand to disempower individuals. They didn't want us to be able to be in charge of our own fate. Uh, very much like what seems to be going on in America right now, where there does seem to be a faction of our society that wants to disempower everyone by canceling them. So um, what happened then was a philosophical argument between Moses and Pharaoh, and Moses outdid Pharaoh. Um, so if he was thought to be an Egyptian, he was favored by the Pharaoh, his philosophy devoured or eclipsed the philosophy of the Pharaoh, which means that he called him out on his bullshit. And then he said, let my people go. And there was a mass exodus of Jews from Egypt who were working on the pyramids. Now, what's really interesting is that recently I saw a few different shows where they deciphered, they, they excavated, um, all the housing for the people that built the pyramids and they were actually treated very well. So it seems that it might've been an opportunity to do a lot of hard labor for some money, very much like some things that some people in this country are doing. Many of them politicians who have their hand in corporate farming are hiring illegal people to work for less, lesser wages than a citizen would. So, you know, it kind of goes way back. And then there was the first wildcat strike. Moses won. He got the attention of the people. He said, I just beat Pharaoh's butt. So who are you going to listen to? So my people, I am a Jew. He outed himself. I am not an Egyptian. I was not born of an Egyptian. I was found by the daughter of the Pharaoh floating around in the Nile. And I don't even want to start talking about the motherhood issues. That he, <laughs> the, <laughs> sorry, the mama drama that poor Moses must have went through. But all of that fits into this allegory and how that parable came about. So, you know, we have to realize that when we're thinking about why do we not have miracles today? In a lot of ways, we do. We do have miracles today. How many times have you seen yourself, have you seen someone or even did this yourself, will yourself into a better state? I have seen people lose a long-term partner and say, I can't live without them. And the next thing you know, they're dead in three or four months. I've seen people on the brink of death. And that would be my personal experience. And I was like, oh, hell no. I can't go looking like this. For whatever reason you need to cling on to, to give you that faith to believe where logic tells you not to. That is the beginning of creating in the quantum. So, that's what Moses did. And Exodus, again, was, I believe, the first wildcat strike. You can agree with that or disagree with it. It's only my hypothesis. But it seems to make sense in the research that I've done on language and symbolism in the ancient world. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Julian Jaynes. Who was he? He was an extraordinary man. He was born in the early 20th century, and I think he died around 1980 or 1990 or something like that. But I'm old enough where I was around where his con he wasn't so controversial anymore because he became controversial in the 30s and 40s uh, with his whole understanding. He was a 20th century Harvard educated psychologist who was one of the first people to introduce the idea of perception equals reality. Many years later, when I was the age that Mr. or Dr. James's 
earliest supporters may have been. We had the Seth material. I don't know if anyone out there remembers the book Seth Speaks. Then there were a few sequels. And they took that same concept. Julian Jaynes said perception equals reality. Seth said, or the woman who wrote a book called Seth Speaks, is my suspicion is that she had to get her idea out, but did it in the safest way possible. That's dependent on somebody she was channeling. He said, as you see your world, so shall it become. Now, these ideas were controversial because they challenged the societal structure by putting more power in the hands of the individual. We can see that in a lot of our spiritual training. I was raised Roman Catholic. I was told that when you fold your hands in prayer, you put them together and you cross your thumbs. Does everybody out there remember that? You can shake your head or make a noise or make. Okay. An ancient text, pre Christian text, before Jesus was born, okay, going way back into Aramaic scripture, which is the earliest, I don't know if they were Assyrian or Babylonian back then. But it was way back to one of our earliest civilizations. Keeping your hands together with your thumbs parallel allowed you to bring up the earth energy into your body and direct it through your hands and then spread it by extending them. When you wanted to contain your power, you crossed your thumbs. And if you think about it, the thumb is like a really important digit because if you get one chopped off, like by some mob guy, you're not going to be able to pick anything up. You cannot work. <laughs> you cannot work your hands without thumbs. So think about that. It's the most powerful and meaningful digit that we have on our hands. And by crossing them, we're holding our power within. We're not allowing it to ex escape us and be directed at someone or something. We're actually containing it within us. And then as a society, we were taught to do that because there was the need for the middlemen, priests, rabbis, ministers, mullahs, mambos, hungans, anybody even witch queens, okay, are doing what that they can to keep their con congregation in check, where they are the only person that has any power. And that's why I raise my teaching collectives the way that I do. You're all empowered. And we might even go into the ring at some point during your training, if you choose to take any of my workshops. And I'm fine with that, because I encourage that I encourage self empowerment. So Julian James, had this really great idea. Uh, and forgive me if I'm referring to my notes, but there's like a lot of material here and I want to make sure that I'm accurate and that I get it right. He was the first person to um, also come up with the theory of the bicameral mind. Now in Latin, bicameral, two rooms. Um, Jung, around the same time, decided to call them the conscious and the unconscious mind. So his bicameral mind theory, it explored, it explored paranormal phenomena why am i getting an echo okay that's done no it isn't uh, <laughs> okay so are we any better can you guys hear me raise your hand if you can because i'm muted excellent okay great so um he had another uh great debate which i include in my my printed material um with a guy named Kurtz, K-U-R-T-Z. And he explored the difference between the bicameral mind between um, perception or consciousness and paranormal phenomena. Now, any of you who know me know that my whole mission is to put the normal back into the paranormal, the physics back into metaphysics, and the psychology back into parapsychology because they are related. It is a place where there is an intersection of science and mysticism. And it takes belief or faith or seeing your world to allow it to become. And I'm going to unmute myself. And... All right. I am, I am not muted. I can't be muted. <laughs> okay. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Okay. So we're talking about that. So at times, the most prevalent question was, were these events, okay, evident, um, paranormal events, people who perform miracles, people who were able, people who were called witches or wizards or the village healers, um, were, they, were they people, were, the, were these events evidence of a single human being with supernatural powers or because of the mindset of the general culture at the time. 
So now we're going to start talking about biblical times all over again. Um, imagine what it was like to live back then. You wake up and you, <laughs> I'm reading one of the chat. <laughs> That's right. No one mutes anything. No one, no one, no one puts baby in the corner. Um, you wake up and you never know if your local emperor is going to decide that everybody who looks like you is going to get their head chopped off today. You never know what the hell is going to happen. So you have a very personal relationship with your gods. Um, and religion back then, prayer back then was not like it is today. It is not like we were taught. I looked at all of those documents that explained ancient prayer methods, and it was one on one. It was you and God. OK, so you got to say, dear Aphrodite, I need a loved one in my life and I will bring you these offerings of roses and honey and frankincense and whatever the hell you're asking for, in which you will bring me my loved one at the end of 28 days. It was one turn of the moon because, again, the moon is still lunar. It's divine feminine. But then they would follow up and they would say, if you don't do that. I'm going to bury your, your statue upside down, outside town. Nobody's going to worship you again, and you're going to have absolutely no power. So there was a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the gods. It was an ecstatic relationship. And the root of the word ecstatic is the word ecstasy, where you just throw yourself into it 150%. You completely submit to what you're believing, to what you're communicating to a higher power. And it puts you on the same level. And you can also threaten them. <coughs> excuse me, and you could bribe them and you could beg them, but it was just you and them. There wasn't a middleman as opposed to most organized religions today that are liturgical, which means that one authority figure, priest, rabbi, minister, whatever, name a religion, they have a, they, they have a cleric is up there telling you, this is what God's telling me to tell you. And then you tell me what you want me to tell God. So you're kind of cut out of the equation. And it is a lesser connection that has a lesser effect on your everyday life. Those of you who are all here who had the curiosity and the courage to pursue esoteric studies are willing to take that responsibility into your own hands. Now, it's funny because I've been trained in many traditions and I was asked by a colleague the other day, do you like low magic or high magic? Well, that means do I like ceremonial work or do I like just doing things on the down low? And I like doing things on the down low, man. I don't want no God or goddess looking over my shoulder <laughs> telling me what to do or how to do it. Um, I will take a, I will assume complete responsibility and accountability for whatever it is that I want to accomplish. And I will do it according to my own ethical standard, which I did learn from society. So um again, the question was, were they evidence of a single human being with supernatural powers or were they because of the mindset of a general culture of the time? I believe it was the latter, because if you think about it, um, way back when, way back in the day, before there was texting, before there was TikTok, before there was Twitter, before there was emailing, uh, everybody had to get along. Everybody had to live in the community. They all had a responsibility to till their land and then, you know, submit some of their crops to, um, you know, the community took care of itself. We had three harvests a year. Everybody shared their bounty. Everybody made sure that the streets were safe and everything else. I don't like vigilante justice, but that was the best that they could do at the time. But you never knew when the Hittites were going to be coming over the hill to rape your women and pillage your community. So these people were spread out all over their geography. And as these tribes grew into larger communities, they occupied more and more land. Somebody sees the Hittites in the distance. And I believe, I choose to believe because it makes the most sense that they uh, communicated telepathically. So then everybody knew the Hittites were coming. The warriors all lined up. They got ready. They either kicked their ass or they didn't. But there was a way of doing that tele telepathically. Um, so you were constantly on edge. It was a very traumatic society and there was a trauma bond between these people. But back in those days, it was it was actually beneficial because it did keep people working together as a functional community. Um, another thing that I have learned, and this is not a hypothesis, this is fact. I was part of a group in the late 90s, early 2000s 
uh, led by um, Professor Lisa, her, what the hell was her name? I believe it was Williams, not Lisa Williams, the psychic. This was another Lisa Williams from Columbia. But she, um, she was working with psychic children. She was a psychotherapist. She was taking children who were oppressed because of their personal experiences and beliefs in the geography or in the geographical demographic that they grew up in. And they found out, she said, my therapist said, and I agree, that the majority of psychic children have had early trauma in their lives. And think about it. You had to be able to send and receive information telepathically. You had to know when that abusive parent was on the warpath and headed to your room. You had to be able to access other realms in order to collect your thoughts and come up with a code of behavior that was going to get you through the immediate threatening moment that wasn't taught to you because nobody teaches you how to deal with an abusive parent. Well, maybe now we will teach our children that or not me, I'm too old. But, you know, up until now, that was the whole thing. So trauma definitely makes you hypersensitive to other nuances, um, other nuances in your energetic field, in the field that you're living in, in the environment that you're living in. And it allows us to communicate and it allows us to receive information. Now, Jung took it a little further, okay, because we're talking about inherited information that we've inherited from our ancient, you know, the ability uh, that we're on the verge of trauma or when our adrenaline fight or flight thing starts kicking in, we can actually become hypersensitive to little nuances in our energy field and come up with an idea about, about how to save us. But Jung's theory, who I love, uh, he called it the collective unconscious. And that is the part of the unconscious mind that connects and accesses ancestral memory. So think of that. We have physical characteristics and even body language and different tics that we've inherited. I've met cousins of mine in Europe that I had never met before, and I knew they were related to me. How did I know? The guy rolled his eyes like I did. He stood the way that I did. He had the same, oh, really? Look, when he was about to go off on somebody. And it was just interesting because it was a family trait. Now, why are these memories not available to be accessed as ancestral memories? How to go there and create something into the present. So that is, um, let's see, it says, all information is present. James said, all information is present within an individual's mind. And that includes personal things we repressed as children in this life, as well as ancestral memories, ancestral coding, behavioral coding, and communicative coding. So I'd like to open this up for discussion, but all of you look like I bored you to tears. <laughs> so if anybody would like to ask a question or challenge something or um, just have anything to say, uh, use the raise hand thing and I'll let you in. And um, we'll see. So none of you really care. Okay, great. <laughs> um, does anybody have any other uh, ideas that they would like to present that sound similar? Okay, Keisha, thank you. Oh, okay, so I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear us? Now I can, yes. Okay. Hi, Anthony. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm in bed. Tell us more about accessing ancestral memories. Well, it, at this point, it has to happen when a switch is flipped. It's usually a result of trauma, shock, that fight or flight thing, adrenaline kicks in. And then we come up with a defensive mechanism that we have actually inherited. But ancestral memories can even bring us back to places. I found out that there are people in my family that have had the abilities that I have. There were readers, there were healers, there were herbalists, all that sort of thing. So my predilection to... Um, wanting to know more about them for my entire life might have been an ancestral memory. Uh, we talk also about soul contracts. When we're coming in here, we pick our parents, we pick the challenges we're going to have. And for the longest time, I was like, I must have been drunk. 
uh, because I really, you know, I really picked some doozies. But now at this age, I can see that I decided to get all the hard stuff out of the way in the beginning. Uh, and that might have been because of something that happened, an ancestral memory. If I had children, my experiences and the way I coped with them or met my challenges could be ancestral DNA. It's almost like spiritual DNA versus, um, you know, versus uh, biological DNA. Did that answer your question or am I just rambling like a crazy man? No, that, that's a really powerful thought because for me, when I think about my ancestry and what is in my ancestral DNA, I usually think about intergenerational trauma okay. rather than, you know, capacities and powers being passed down. I think about bad patterns. Well, there are bad patterns that are passed down, but also good ones. It's just that as a society, we are trained to focus on where we are broken rather than where we have been victorious mm. uh, because you know mm. there seems to be a little bit of a blame game going on where a lot of people try to escape accountability i find that in my private practice uh, there are many people that are right on the verge of wellness and all they have to do is take that one extra step make that one extra commitment but then they stop because mm. the stigma of the diagnosis or the stigma of the issue gives them comfort. They don't have to be, account I can't ever do that. I can't be held responsible because I am fill in the blank. So it's a way of exempting them and helping them to have um, what's called repetition compulsion so that that trauma is reinforced. And then their excuse or not so much an excuse. It's more of a fear of even attempting anything. It's a fear of failure. And eventually they figure out that failure uh, or even doing something that they consider wrong, making mistakes is the greatest teacher. They're not positive when you continue making the same one over and over and over again. But it is a societal imposition to focus on the negative because if we don't look at how broken we are, then suddenly we, we might be empowered mm -hmm. and our powers that be don't want us to have power. Now, mm -hmm. Keisha, you just went through that in real life with a job <laughs> thing i mean i was when you were talking made me think of my first law firm job mm -hmm. i had what it took me a few years to figure out i was um in my office and there was a partner that was especially he was a bully mm -hmm. and came in my office i don't even know what he said but i felt this energy move to my hands and it went into fists and it was under my desk. Really? <laughs> and I was like, I'm not a violent person, <coughs> you know me. And um, I had this voice in my head that says, take this white man out. Wow. And I was like, who in my family? <laughs> and I started asking questions. And finally, one Christmas, my dad said, yeah, your great grandparents were afraid for their lives you know wow. so you KKK inherited yeah. was going yeah. after him in rural louisiana and somebody didn't make it great uncle so-and-so got killed and i was like okay because it felt old right it didn't feel like yours but nope. it was really emphatic because i've had those impulses yeah. too yeah. like snatch that bitch's wig right off her head and it's like well where's that coming from <laughs> and it's like well i'll snatch yeah. you know i have yeah. a whole drawer full of like tracks and weaves and even a lace front or two but uh the impulse again is so you know i i've had impulses in um in ritual that were not mine uh things like bloodletting i always keep a little package of um what do you call those little white plastic things that you stick that for to test yourself for diabetes um I can't remember the, the brand name and the, but everybody knows what I mean. And you put it on a piece of parchment and then you put it on the charcoal and allow the element of fire to transform it and have it merge with air as smoke and carry your, you know, to me that, you know, that's our, vi that's our vitality. Uh, blood is the life force. So to offer your blood is like the ultimate commitment. It's like, I'm putting my blood on the line here. And I don't know where that came from, but I just started doing it out of nowhere. And then I read many years later, that it was um, a very common thing in certain temples. And believe it or not, among scribes, 
in the middle kingdom of Egypt. You had to put a drop of your blood in the paint to give it life, to give the words life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was never taught that, but I was like, all right, you know, get me my little, my little sticker and, and here we go. Uh, so yeah, I do think there are things that inherited that trauma, whether it's enormous long-term trauma, like my childhood or an immediate confrontation that's going to make you say or do or think something that just never you don't even have time to wonder where it came from and um so what you do sorry people are still wandering in i love that uh so what you do is you just sort of react to it and find yourself doing it uh without even planning to and then those are the things that we really need to examine and as you did do some study you know get some historical data on our own family it could be familial in your case it was from a family member uh, and other people it might be a tribal memory so it might not be somebody in your blood family but someone that you shared a uh, community with at some point in the past but that is what i'm saying can be accessed and it can be accessed easier than you think and i'm going to teach that method in a little while but alex and keisha great questions I'm going to get to Christina and see what her question is. And if anybody else wants to shoot their mouth off, do it. It's fascinating to me because I hear what we're talking about and I feel like it's so multi-layered, right? There's mm -hmm. ancestral memories, there's past life memories. Mm -hmm. um, some of the stuff that both you and Keisha described, which to me feels like muscle memory, but it's ancestral muscle, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Um, how do we sift through understanding and differentiating between what might be a past life memory, but an ancestral memory? And then if we are having the ancestral memory, uh, not that we assume responsibility for all of our ancestors, but we have the option, I'm asking, to participate in the healing of that pain that has traveled from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. Excellent, excellent, excellent question. And I'm not saying that just to kill a couple of seconds like most people do, <laughs> because it gives us the opportunity to not only heal ourselves, but to um, also heal our ancestors. When I was being, now before, okay, when I was being trained in, uh, in Haitian voodoo, there's a saying, we stand tall on the shoulders of our proud ancestors. Some of my ancestors were a little shady, okay? And it's like, how the hell am I, I mean, I like, stand tall at five foot two is a little rough to begin with, but these shady mothers, you know, it's going to be, you know, I'm going to need like a pogo stick or something. Um, so what we have to do is understand the origin of that. Keisha, you, had a, you found a very specific event in your family. You can go back and you can heal that man of his anger, his shame, of everything he experienced by being at the mercy of a bunch of animals, everything that damaged his soul. Because souls are not meant to, be, to remain damaged. They're not meant to remain broken. It's up to us as healers to be able to repair that because by, so you find it in yourself and you repair it within yourself. And when you do that in your present self, it will reach back and heal the previous generation. And I bet you, you will never have that impulse again. And any children you may have or will have in the future will not have that that automatic impulse in them because you have gone back and righted the wrong that caused the pain and broke the spirit. Spirits need to be fixed. They don't fix themselves. Now, Jenny Horn wrote in chat, during a second session with an energy healer, I threw up my ancestor's anger. So I believe it was very true. I wouldn't have until I experienced it. And Jenny, if you want to come on and talk a little bit more about that, you may. I can. Uh, pardon? I can, if you want me to. Yeah, sure. Like, let me. Uh, I was just I... dinner. <laughs> um, okay, there you go. So, yeah, let's. Can you tell us the details of that? Or, yeah. You know. So, um, I kind of started this um, when my mom. You, you know, but others don't. My right. mom, about two and a half years ago, was diagnosed um, with cancer. She has since passed away. Or I guess three years ago, she has since passed away. And when she got diagnosed, I kind of 
went on this kind of journey of healing myself because I started identifying that um, cancer could be, um, and especially in her case, she wasn't a person to express herself. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of stored um, emotions. And I kind of noticed how her on the female side, there was like this lack of expressing, you know, emotions. And okay. was that um, generational or regional? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. I think it is. It's, it's, um, we're Polish, Polish and Russian, okay. um, on my mom's side. And they experienced a lot of female and male side, a lot of trauma, just mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of wars, you know, mm -hmm. uh, prisoners of war, things, mm -hmm. things like that, um, just, you know, being in that area. Um, so when they immigrated to the United States, I think it was kind of a do over and then trauma seemed to kind of follow them. Um, so having said that, um, I had met this energy healer. It was actually for my mom because my mom was given, um, basically like a week to live and, um, found this energy healer. My mom was on board, thankfully. Um, and through seeing this woman, it actually extended her life. And she was with us for another three months, was able to see like her 75th birthday and have a party, you know, all these things. So I, when you said there aren't miracles today, I was like, there are miracles. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I've definitely well, that's what I meant. I said, how many definitely. times have you seen somebody will themselves? Yeah. 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 I mean, I've definitely um, seen it and been very grateful um, mm -hmm. for them. But um, um, so because my mom had this great experience and I was her caretaker, um, I was like, I need healing too, right? To be able to take care of my mom. So mm -hmm. I um, booked a session with her and I had just done like a 15 minute demo, like at this like health uh -huh. expo. So, and that was already moving. So I was like, I'll just, you know, I'll book an hour session with her. And I mean, it was within maybe like five minutes, all of a sudden, like even my voice changed. Um, mm -hmm. wow. And it was, I was just, I was so mad and I was so enraged and I had um, all of this like guilt and shame and, um, and anger. And I just, I really legitimately not like food throw up but I could feel the emotions coming out of my body. Mm -hmm. So anytime I've never been with a shaman before, but I've seen it in movies, like where, you know, they take peyote and they're sweating and, you know, they're having this like, you know, out of body experience. That's exact. I was, I it looked like I just run a marathon. I was, I mean, this went on for about wow. 30 minutes. I was sweating um, profusely and I just kept vomiting up these emotions and, wow. um, and had to keep saying I'm releasing my ancestors, like anger, um, and guilt and shame. Um, and it was just like, and as I kept saying it, it was, um, like I said, my voice became very male. Like it was, um, okay. very mad. And, um, and I realized I was, it was like, God, it's not my own, you know, <laughs> like it wasn't, mm -hmm. It wasn't anything that I, it wasn't anything that belonged to me. Um, and after that session, obviously that was a little um, jarring. <laughs> um, yeah, it'll shake session, you up a little. I would say like, it was hard for me um, like living in New York city for 16 years, it's easy to get mad. Um, and <laughs> I could not, I could not get mad at anybody. Like I just, I couldn't even, I couldn't feel that emotion for, it took me a year. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, Nicole has been on here before and Nicole's like, I'll feel mad for you. you know. Oh. Um, but I couldn't feel, I could not, I still, I can get mad, but I don't get that burning, like right. on air mad anymore. I just, I can't feel that. Anymore. So what you've done is you healed that yeah. specific ancestor, but we've also done is you've healed anyone who can, any of their progeny who yeah. came after them. Yeah, right up to the current generation. So this is what you know, people will feel these things and respond to them unconsciously, uh, and not know what's going on in a way that's good, because they try to temper themselves to not feel that again, if they feel that it's really inappropriate. And that's like a good sort of band aid or a little kind of a weak stopgap. Um, but someone who has a predilection for healing to work as a healer is going to go deeper and deeper into the origin of where that came from and on either on their own or consult another professional right. who does who is legitimate who is you know a certified healer of some sort uh not somebody who wants to be one and just calls themselves and because i had another <laughs> another one of those encounters today with somebody that just does that um, I was like, okay, fine. 
you know, I'll get back to you later on. But the point is you sought help. You realized that you were going through something where you needed help. You discovered something that goes way back in your ancestry that really wasn't, well, it was connected to the immediate uh, trauma you were experiencing, but not to your knowledge. So by going that deep, you unearthed it. Yeah. And it was, I could also Ah. feel it in my bones. Like it was deep um in um like my thigh bones um and like my pelvic bones like it was painful like there wasn't wow. um and the healer was like it's it's embedded in your d it's part of your dna mm-hmm. um and it's funny because i always saw like my dad's side they have a lot of anger and i was like i'm not like that at all um but as my mom the sicker my mom got i think the matter i probably got mm-hmm. and i think that um and i'd gone through my own you know traumas of um of loss before my mom um, so it was, um, I think I just had a lot of built up stuff. Yeah. Um, well, you were going through an awful lot. Yeah. And so uh. I think, you know, the healer said, cause I said, is this normal? Like, does this like happen? You know? And so she's like, no, she was like, you were just really, your body was ready to let it go. And she was like, it's this, I would never like set the expectation, you know, for by your, you know, first real session for something like this to happen. Sometimes it takes years. Oh yeah. Um, something like this to transpire but well, again, it's, we bury it uh that's why the last thing that i read about jane is um that uh james i'm sorry uh his theory is that part of the unconscious mind connects to ancestral memory but also current memories traumatic memories that have been buried i mean how many times do you see that uh i've seen documentaries i've actually worked with people one-on-one where after a really long time, we finally got them to access something that they sublimated because it was so traumatic. In very extreme cases, um, fragmented personality, if anybody saw the movie Sybil or read The Three Faces of Eve or any of those movies about multiple personalities, they are repressed. It's repressed emotional trauma that has to express itself, but you're so freaked out about it that the only way it can express itself is by your conscious mind not even being aware. So it develops a whole new personality to present itself, which I've tried passing off <laughs> for, to cover up for some of my bad behavior, but nobody believed it. Nobody believed they had Tourette's. Nobody believed they had multiple personality disorder. This is now you're just an asshole. But I mean, it's, that's how powerful these, these things can be, these responses to these early. And now we're beginning to understand inherited trauma, generational trauma that is still unresolved. And if you're lucky and if you have the courage, you can resolve them, not only for yourself in the present to improve the quality of your own life, um, but also to release the, the people who came before us, generations before us, from the pain that they still might be stuck in, from the fear that they still might be suffering from. It's an amazing thing, and it requires courage, it requires concentration, and it requires know-how on how to access that. And Jenny says, hi, it was. I am no longer being weighed down by it. Yes, real magic indeed. Um, So Scott Wass wants to join us. So my magic mouse is not so much. There we go. Hey, Scott, what's up? Hey. No, I just wanted to say that I think you're absolutely right. I am claustrophobic, and I think it's because I was the boy in the bubble. So I was in a bubble for about a year and a half of my life. This is for real, though. Nope. You said you were for real encased in a bubble in this life. Yes. Yes. Okay. Because nobody here knows your lifetime. backstory. Okay. Oh, right. Yes. I'm sorry. I was That's born okay. with not enough white blood cells. So I had to be in a bubble from baby to one and a half years old. And I think because of that is why my psychic ability developed as strong as it did. Yeah. Uh, trauma you're right and also being cut off so your urge as an infant is to communicate and connect with my mother she couldn't right. touch me so i had to feel what she was going through and then the so doctors you, and- you were able to develop this that's great that's really cool so that yeah. you know and i look at all the lunacy that i had to deal with and it's like okay so it just made you very aware acutely aware yeah. of what's acutely going on. aware that is so and beautiful maybe the though. fear Oh, thank yeah. you. I mean, it's so beautiful that you were able to do that uh, because 
I was just about to say you're very well adjusted, but who am I to judge because I'm a little bit out there? So. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, it actually just made me think like what you said made sense. And I've, I realize I'm claustrophobic. So that must be mm-hmm. related to some trauma yeah. that I had from being, I couldn't get out. Right. I have a know? terrible fear of heights. And when I think of it, I always think of myself falling off of something and then slamming into something hard. I don't know what the something is that I fell off of. I don't know what the something hard is that I slammed into, but it didn't happen to me in this life. Mm-hmm. So it must, because my earliest memory of that was I was around two or three years old and we were here in New York and my father, we were on the observation deck of the, um, the Empire State Building and he picked me up. I mean, he wasn't near the edge, so don't anybody call Dyfus or, you know, um, he just picked me up so I could see the city from up high. And I remember, I didn't even know if I was able to talk yet, but I remember thinking, don't move a muscle because he will say that, um, you wriggled out of his hands. Wow. And it didn't happen. <laughs> wow. Zoom user says to everyone, audio isn't working. When you've arrived to accept your gifts and make peace with the past of yourself, others, and generational suffering, next step. Well, you then get to, so the next step, after you complete uh, the process of um, discovering the genesis of your trauma and that it might have been a generational inheritance that you have. You have to heal that. Your next step then is to heal yourself of all of the other wounds that you might have incurred during this lifetime. And then if you can't find any within yourself, resonate with other people heal others. When you're healing other people, that healing reflects immediately back to you. Um, if there's something about yourself that is so hard to face, uh, and you know what it is, um, I know of, okay, I don't have to mention names and I can just keep it very general. Someone who had been sexually abused as a child, they're aware of it. They've really managed to keep themselves, you know, their emotions in check. They don't go bananas anymore at, you know, at the slightest little stimulus, but they found it really hard to go within and face themselves. So what they've done is they volunteered with victims of sexual abuse to heal them. So by healing them externally, that external healing energy is reflecting back to the sender and healing themselves. That's part of the myth of Chiron, the wounded healer. When we're wounded, we have three choices, three responses that immediately happen. And this will tell you how much damage was done ancestrally to you, possibly. Um, do you ignore it and pretend it isn't there and then eventually let it get you and kill you and die from it? Or do you try to inflict that same pain on anyone who comes near you? That's uh, actually a prevalent thing. The abuser often identify the abused the the abused child will often identify with their abuser, and then become abusive themselves and continuing to abuse people. And then the third choice is to heal others with the same affliction, so that you can then have that healing energy reflect inward. And so you're healing yourself by proxy. If you don't have it in you to look at yourself in the eye. You know, I've done it. I don't have a problem with that. I can only say, bitch, you're in trouble, you know, in my bathroom mirror and then just straighten it right out. But a lot of people are afraid to do that because they're daunted um, by that. So you find somebody else with the same issue. Uh, This is also how you heal ancestral issues, ancestral uh, trauma that has been unresolved. You will extend kindness and love to people that were treated badly. Uh, Keisha, in your story, hopefully those clansmen's progeny will realize how messed up that dynamic was in that generation of the family and then go in the complete opposite direction to undo it, to foster people coming together and getting along together to foster integrating societies. And I'm not talking about the political integration. I'm talking about true integration where we are interdependent, 
where it doesn't matter. We are there to help people. And you will work off your ancestors' sins. You will make them proud of themselves. Because trust me, once those guys died that did that to your, your ancestor, they realized what pieces of crap they were. Um, and they probably raised sons who were just like them, who weren't going to do anything about it. So now it will be up to further along the line to step back and heal those wounds, to fix those broken parts, and then fix it for everybody subsequent. Um, so that's it. So I don't know if the audio still isn't working for Zoom user. Uh, I hope you heard that. I don't know who you are. Um, but you can type something in chat if you did hear the answer. So how do we access it? How do we access our own ancestral archive? It's sort of like a mini Akashic record uh, library. Uh, you can do it through meditation. Okay, good. So Zoom user has heard. You can also put your name in in case I know who you are. It would be nice to say hello to somebody I know. <laughs> so um, how do we access it? Uh, there are ways of doing this with um, visualization and, um, and meditation. And what I'll do, if you like, uh, you can say yes or no uh, when I shoot this past you. I can give you a really quick journey to go to visually that's going to give you both rooms, the unconscious and conscious mind, where you can literally go looking into the unconscious for ancestral wounds uh, that might need to be healed or pull out strengths from your ancestors. It's a really cool thing to do. You have to be relaxed. When you do this, you should give yourself as much time as you can afford i usually like saying two hours then if i'm done before two hours i have some time to just like piss away doing stupid things um but if not i might need to revel in it or i might need more time make sure you cannot and will not be disturbed during the time you're doing this but it starts out um i'm even going to go into pranic breathing uh we're just going to start by if you can everybody just Relax every muscle in their body. I'm not going to do the ball of light going up your body because we're not going to do a full-fledged uh, path working right now. But this is something you're going to remember. And if you allow yourself to come along for the ride, you're going to be able to access it and really go deep with it and take a lot longer than we have because we're already on an hour. So you start by breathing in, fully inflating your lungs through your nose very slowly. Relax all of your muscles, loosen your bra, whatever it is that's make, that might make you uncomfortable or restricted. Sorry, I'm a jerk, I admit it. Breathe all the way in through your nose and then exhale through your mouth and just feel your body rhythm and your biorhythm lowering and lowering and lowering. And if it was a pulse, you'll hear the pulse getting slower and deeper in tone until you're at that place where it's just level. And then you can either keep your eyes closed or keep them open without being distracted. And you're starting out, and this experience is gonna be different for everybody. Everybody's, once you discover your dwelling, your house, uh, the house is always going to be the same every time you go back to it. But the journey there, that the initial journey there, which you can fill in later if you want to when you have more time. Um, is what's going to build the foundation for this exercise and this ability. So you're breathing very regularly, very deeply, very slowly. You're lowering your rhythm. And you're outdoors. Uh, you're in nature. You might be on a dirt path. You might be walking through a meadow. Uh, that is all going to be a reflection of your inner elements, your earth, air, water, and fire. You need to feel a breeze. I don't know how strong it's going to be, but you are now feeling a breeze. So you know that you're in nature and there's a little bit of a breeze. So, so far we have earth and air. You're feeling the warmth of the sun because it's daylight and that's our fire element. And I don't know how hot it is. That's your, that's your story. So you're walking through nature, feeling a breeze, feeling the warmth of the sun. And you'll either see a brook or hear a brook. And you're walking on level ground and then it suddenly begins to incline. And as it's inclining, 
you're feeling the terrain beneath your feet change a little bit. It feels more like a definite path. And it's not a steep incline, but it is, you do know, it's not quite a struggle, but it is a conscious effort uh, to continue at the same pace. So if you can regulate your footsteps in this visualization to sort of sync with your breathing, that would make it a lot more, um, a lot more florid. It would make it a lot richer for you to imagine. So you're doing this and now all of a sudden you know that you have to make a turn. There's a gravel path that's coming to the path that you're walking on and you'll turn either left or right onto that path and you'll hear the gravel beneath your feet and you'll continue up the incline and then the land levels off again and you're walking up to a dwelling it's a house it might be made of stone it might be made of wood it might be thatched it could be made of anything but i want you to reach out and touch the outside of the house feel the texture of what the house is made of and you're seeing a door with a window on either side and you know that you have the right to enter this building this is your spiritual home it is your temple it is a temple of your bicameral mind and you open the door and you walk in and to your surprise the room that you're in looks very much like your own living room or the room in your home where you feel that you have the most privacy and the most access if you look out the windows of this room on this house on the hill, you're going to see the street you live on. You're going to see everything you see from where you live your day-to-day -day life. That room represents your conscious mind. This is everything that you know for sure from your day-to-day -day life. And you see the same furniture and the same lamps and the same pile of dishes you might have left in the sink the other day. <laughs> everything is exactly like your home as you know it like your life as you know it except for one wall in that room that's a solid wall with a doorway in the middle now you walk up to that doorway and you open the door and what you immediately notice is that a rush of cooler air comes out of that room it's very dimly lit it's very sparsely furnished as a matter of fact it's almost pitch black from darkness and the only item of furniture in it is a horizontal surface with a small blue light, small blue flame flickering on it. The horizontal surface could be a table. It could be a prayer table. It could be an altar. It could be just a big stone. But there's the only thing in that room is a horizontal surface with a small flickering deep blue flame that is your unconscious mind so the room that's familiar is your conscious mind the dark cooler room with that little tiny flicker of light because that's where we go for enlightenment is to our to, to reach into our unconscious you'll see that little blue flame on that horizontal surface now what i'd like you to do is straddle the doorway put your left foot into the dark room and have your right foot in the familiar room and extend your left hand and see if it starts to tingle see if you get any memories or any images because what you're doing is you're heightening your left side which is your receptive side to access whatever is in that room and then it'll materialize in your hand if it's a memory of a toy that you had when you were a child that is attached to an event that is either positive or negatively impacted you. You can now look at it. You can bring it into the doorway with, that you're straddling with you. Um, if it's something that you know is powerful but not able to be seen right now, it might be in a box or in some kind of a container that you know can be opened. I want you to take that container and pass it to your right hand and place it on the floor in the room that is familiar to you. And continue doing that every time you go to this house. 
you can leave something on the altar next to the flame on the horizontal surface next to the flame if you like bring a gift from your conscious life bring something from your conscious mind it whether it's a positive or a negative if you know that you have an anger issue leave your anger on that horizontal uh surface in the dark room which is the unconscious mind and allow it to be lit by that blue flame not on fire just illuminated so it can be seen and then you can visit it in the future and really put your whole self step into the dark room and unwrap this present or box or whatever it is that you found there that you have brought from your conscious life into your unconscious and it's a safe place to be able to explore what has wounded us, to explore what gives us empowerment. And then once you do do that, once you decipher that, you can then bring that object or that discovery into the, the light room. So now, now it is in your conscious mind and your everyday life. This is how we reach hidden memories, hidden trauma, things that have wounded us, things that have harmed us, things that have frightened us. This is how we can actually heal ourselves because you're probably going to get a backstory when you're examining these objects that you brought from the dark room into the light or from the light room into the dark in order to be healed. Because let's not forget this works both ways. You can find what's messing you up in the dark room and bring it clothed, cloaked into the light room and then leave it there and then the next time you have time to do this meditation you're going to find it right where you left it in the light room and you're going to shed light on it you're going to examine it and see what it is and you're going to repair it and then you're going to place it back into the dark room on the other hand if you bring something that's really bothering you from your present life into the dark room you can either work on it in that session or go back to it in a later one and unwrap it unpack it find out how it can be repaired and then repair it in the unconscious because you're kind of monitoring your own unconscious and it's a very safe place to do this and when you know that you have repaired it you can then bring it into the light room which represents your conscious everyday life and that issue will have been resolved that trauma will have been healed and by healing your own traumas and this is getting back to something that someone asked earlier um how do you heal their trauma you heal it from within yourself and then by doing that you're reaching back across the centuries and you're healing your ancestors who have been wounded who have been harmed who have unknowingly and unconsciously allowed you to inherit that harm until it is addressed because that is a greater explanation of what is known as repetition compulsion in, psych in traditional psychotherapy. When we're traumatized, we play that movie over and over and over again, and we can't get past it. And we know how it ends. We keep on putting ourselves through that. We choose life partners sometimes that represent a parent who traumatizes us, trying to heal that relationship. And we keep fucking up until we have the courage and the compassion to really take it apart and repair it. And then you're freeing yourself of it and you're freeing yourself from passing it along to anyone in the future, whether it's your child or any kind of an associate. And if you had already passed that on to people in your life, they will be healed from the harm you visited on them because you were too traumatized and too frozen to be able to do anything about it. But it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, so I urge you, I encourage you to go up that through that meadow, whatever your journey was. Mine is usually on a um, tall grass in a meadow and I can smell it. Uh, it smells like June, uh, little yellow flowers on the tall grass. And then I can just keep on parting it with my hands. And then I eventually see that other people have traveled this path and I follow that. And then I hit the gravel driveway and it goes up further. My house is stone. I don't know what yours was, but it's always going to be the same now that you've experienced it. And your room, your conscious room is going to always, if you change your apartment or your home, your conscious room is going to reflect exactly as your home is right now. Your unconscious room is going to remain constant, cooler, dark, empty, 
one horizontal surface and one blue flame. It could be a candle. It could be uh, a, in Strega, they have fire bulbs where they burn alcohol to get a blue flame. Anything that produces a blue flame because the, the, the color blue is associated with the unconscious mind. So if you think about that, blue is, is associated with the, the quarter of the west, the direction of west, the element of water and the unconscious mind. And by being a blue flame, it is bringing illumination to the unconscious mind. And that is where you become enlightened in a very safe, safe, safe place. And then you can bring those damaged parts into the light to heal them and bring things from the light that are screwing you up into the unconscious. So you finally can deal with them because while they're in that room, they're not going to be in your life anymore. You're not going to have those impulses. You're not going to have those triggers set you into motion. You're going to be able to suppress that impulse that you finding is that you found has screwed you up and finally be able to repair it in private very safely in your dark room with the blue flame. And that's how you do it. And then when you're finished, you leave the house, you walk yourself back down your gravel path through your meadow or forest or wherever um, you had to go through to get there. And now that we've kind of done this together and you've all visualized it, if you've really submitted to the, to the visualization, you're not going to have to remember. You're not going to have to refer to notes. You're going to know exactly how to get there. You're going to see yourself by that house. You're going to be touching it on the outside. You're going to know what it feels like. You're going to know what the inside is and you're not going to be able to, you can't wait to fix the broken things from yourself or other people. So that is that. I'm reading chat. Mandy remembered a childhood memory she forgot about for years. That is terrific. But, so now, if you want to, you can go back to that room in meditation. You can revisualize this whole thing when you have the time and the privacy to do it and really explore it. It was, well, most of our, well, we're talking about healing trauma here. So yes, it was traumatic. But you can look at that young Randy and say, hey, I'm you many years later. You survived. I wasn't able to protect you back then, but I can now. So if you trust me, if you trust me and let me embrace you, I'm going to heal you from what it did. And by doing that, you're going to heal yourself every step of the way from the trauma of that memory that occurred from that time right up until today. And it will no longer be an obstacle for you. Sometimes it takes a couple of tries. Sometimes it takes several tries. Sometimes you stick it out in one long session and you get to the bottom of it. But every time you do it, you're chipping away at the trauma, at the blockage that it brings you. And you're freeing yourself a little more and you're becoming more and more empowered to have survived that trauma. Uh, does anyone want to add something to that before we wrap? Uh, does anyone have anything to say? You want to call me an asshole? You want to tell me? Uh, anybody want to talk about that experience or, or shall we just blow out? Or does anybody, I just forgot that I also offered to do um, a reading. Does anybody want a three or a nine card reading on anything? Or was this like, okay, Scott. All right, dude, go ahead. I'll take a reading from the okay. master. It's the master. Okay, what is it? What would you like to know? What am I reading about? Uh, and let me start shuffling. Um, I don't know. Can it be general? No, right? Anything you want. I mean, is there a, a topic that you want me to look at? Um, no, I think everything was good. I had a really good spiritual awakening. So, uh, okay. general. So um, let's just look at your path. now. Let's see what's happening yeah. in your now or what's going to yeah, happen. Now. And then Janet, I see your hand up. I'll get to you as soon as I finish with Scott. I wonder what that's going to sound like. Not that bad, actually. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. That's the good I've thing heard about really having a unidirectional like... mic. Yeah. That it doesn't pick up everything. Um, so these are going to be quick. If you, um, yeah. if you want a longer reading, you can go to anthonycentral.com and book a reading. And uh, just email me or text me and we'll, we'll work that out. So let's see what's going on with Mr. Scott. If I can do this without writing anything on my keyboard. <laughs> if you ever saw my setup, man, you would think 
What kind of hillbilly is this? <laughs> I love it. Okay. All right. Well, it's interesting because uh, the way I read nine cards, which I will teach you guys someday. Um, so there's been a period of um, mulling over your feelings, basically really examining your feelings about what's been going on and not sure there's been a change. And see, you're going to hate this because not you're going to hate it. It's just we know each other. So um, I know some things about you, but I can see that there was a change that was made about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And you're thinking about what am I going to do? And you might not have been feeling very confident. Uh, you might have been feeling vulnerable. That's a better word. Vulner more vulnerable because of change. Mm. Uh, and now, presently, you're feeling that you're standing on solid ground, uh, which is terrific. But you still have the ability to be emotional because you come out of the rough water. You're standing on solid ground. And then what lies before you in this area is it, it's a great card. It means working with people of like mind toward common goals. You've also presently connected with your own sense of empowerment. And you've actually made some improvements. You've made some uh, you've made some observations it's like the core me is cool but i have some peripheral energy that's a little funky so i got to move it away maybe some of my responses some of the ways i move forward some of the ways i retain myself have to change but i have decided that i am empowered i am strong but i do have some changes to make particularly where it comes to knowing what to walk away from instinctively instead of trying to accommodate everything there are certain things that you now will know intuitively what is not worth your time to deal with. You're also, I think, beginning to see more opportunities around you that you haven't been able to see before. You're going to go through the gateway into the next chapter. Uh, and remember, when you're going through that gate, we leave what you don't need anymore at the gate and pick up what somebody else might have left that you know you're going to need. Because once you do make this change, once you go into the next chapter, you're going to have the wind at your back. I have an ace of swords. And aces are always benefic and they're gifts from the universe and swords are about vitality. So once you go through, once you go through into your next chapter, you're going to go gangbusters and you're going to mm -hmm. have a lot of universal strength behind you to empower you. But the main thing is, is to learn the lessons you've learned, particularly about knowing instinctively what to walk away from, because what happens is you then start to neglect yourself. You're a healer. You want to heal everybody in sight and you forget to heal yourself. So it's about recharge and taking the time to recharge your own batteries and knowing when someone is being a psychic vampire who's mm -hmm. just sapping your strength and not doing anything with it because that's Amazing. not healing. Okay. So I don't know if that sounds like anything you're going through. Oh my God. Everything. I okay, mean, cool. totally. And everything with realization, it's all on point. Blessings, love and light. I mean, it's yeah. incredible. Cool. Very totally. cool. Janet took her yeah. hand down. I wonder why. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Anybody you else? You're amazing. Uh, well, no, thank you. that's just a quick reading. But, uh, oh, I see a couple of things in chat. So I almost muted myself. This is how bad I, I told you I'm worse at Zoom than I am at driving. Um, Alex wants a reading if there's time. Uh, well, it'll be a mini reading. Where'd Keisha go? Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry okay it's a mini reading i can only do a couple of minutes oh, yeah. on the it's air so the what is it that we're uh wait let me just start getting these god i'm fucking everything up here <laughs> including my reputation with my filthy <laughs> mouth okay not too late so while i'm shuffling just give me a little bit of background on what part of your life you want me to look into I need to connect with my ancestors and I have been particularly isolated or disconnected from my family line. I was raised as the only child of a single mother who left her community. And so everything I know about my ancestors, I heard secondhand from her and I need to reconnect with them because there's some work I need to do with her while she's still alive and I can't do it through her directly. Okay. So we're going to see how do you access that information or that ability. Okay. 
first card I have here tells me that somehow you're getting in your own way. The devil card in tarot is usually representative of a mechanism that we activate that uh, works to our own self undoing. So that would indicate to me that you're ready to leave that. There are things you might have been told, there might there are things that you might have told yourself that marginalize you or that make you feel marginalized. And that is getting in your own way. But I'm also seeing it's interesting because your interest in this now and how to do it without referencing your mom or any of the things that she told you trying to find your own way represents a grand departure from that kind of uh, energy, that self-defeating energy. And it says that if you continue to actually leave that behind and I see, you know, I, I'm sorry for the circumstances. I mean, it sounds like it might've been very lonely um, only child of a single mom. How many of those were around? Uh, was there stigma? I mean, what are your reasons? What are the wounds that that inflicted on you? And it just seems that on an unconscious level, you might have been using that um, that role to marginalizing yourself. But you are ready. I mean, energetically and intuitively, you're ready to just make a grand departure, take all of your energy away from that. And once you do which you're in the process of doing, you're going to see so many things around you that you haven't been able to see before. So many opportunities to accomplish your goal, which is to reconnect with your ancestry. It's about establishing yourself into a place of sovereignty in your own life. Uh, so there's a difference. Um, what happened to you may have been traumatic. It may have traumatized you in some way. And that is truly tragic. But now you are your own emperor. You are not that victim uh, so it's by assuming the role everybody saw the doorknob i've been hiding assuming the role of emperor which is sovereignty in one's own life is going to bring you a new sense of movement or vitality so all of a sudden you're going to be energized and then i have a queen of wands queens are about control wands are about ideas words information documents so you're going to really kind of dig into this there's going to be an opportunity for you to dig into it have i'm seeing the leaves uh have you done anything on ancestry have you connected with any people so it might be really good for you to share with them to get a hold of them even harangue them Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, I was raised in a fucking vacuum <laughs> and let's share information. I don't want to move next door. I'm not looking for anything. I just want to know who the hell I am and what I come from. And this would really help me a lot because it would help you establish yourself as sovereign. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what, so that's that queen of wands impulse, taking control of the narrative. And then I have, there's a lot of things that are very confusing to you right now. A lot of thoughts, a lot of words. You don't know what to believe in the repository of information that you have on this topic. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So it's like, is this a bunch of bullshit? Is it? Not? So the only, so this is interesting. The best way to get past that, because it will continue to be confusing and continue to contribute to your self undoing. Mm. Um, you have to shackle every method you've used in the past to the past very securely otherwise you're going to be stuck in that same position and then move forward with a new trajectory that's going to serve you more broadly so if everything you've been doing so far hasn't been working it means it's not going to work if you keep on doing it so if it's just referencing the information that you have as concrete is not satisfactory stop doing it we're not getting any younger the clock is tick not even ticking it's talking and you do have access to information that will fill out all those voids and tell you the truth what the truth is and what the truth isn't and i have a feeling you're going to find some things that are going to be very disappointing about the source of your information thus far, but it is also going to give you the context to have enough compassion to be able to move beyond that and then either directly heal that person by approaching them or indirectly through meditation, through energy work, uh, as we talked about healing our wounds. Um, and what's really cool about that is that you are then going to be in complete harmony. Kings are harmony. So apparently this has been quite something for you emotionally and has created some disharmony. So by just saying, you know what, fuck that, that didn't work. I don't know if I can trust them. I don't know if I can trust him, her, whoever. So now I have access to something. I keep on seeing those three little leaves. 
there are people that are going to tell you the truth. You're going to learn the backstory. You're mm-hmm. going to find things to be really proud of and really happy about. And you're going to be le- you're going to be able to leave any trauma behind and also heal the trauma of the person who passed it on to you, starting from the most recent and working backwards. And that, my friend, is a big job. And it looks like you're up for it. And it looks like you'll succeed if you can if you continue to move toward um, realizing that goal. So I hope that was helpful. Wow. And we're going to get to Janet. See if Janet has the balls to put her face on the screen. <laughs> Anthony, I don't know how to use uh, the Zoom so well. I'm sorry. That's right. I'm hearing you. So what is the question? Um, well, I guess I'm kind of interested in um, finding out about my health. Mm-hmm. Okay. Having a little issue. And also just generally whatever you see that comes up that just comes to the surface if it's not my health, whatever it is that's showing itself to you. Anything that is a threat to your well-being, physical, emotional, spiritual, or otherwise, how's that? That sounds good. Yes, that sounds good. Cool. Because when I teach tarot, I tell people that the most important part of tarot is helping the client come up with their question or you can spend all day there taking all their money and i'm just looking into chat alex says wow that was a mini reading yeah 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 that's many for me Uh (laughs) i can attest i hope that was inspirational alex because this will really help you get to the bottom of this instead of letting it beat you up all right, Miss Janet. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Janet is someone who I trained, what was it, Janet, 1980? In the 80s, yes. <laughs> we go way back. That's right. And we were hellfire. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was, was a group. That was a group that was just fearless. <laughs> it was so much fun. Yep. And troublemaking was us. um okay um oh this is good this is really good um your current relationship is actually very empowering for you so that's you know that's healthy so we wanted to know anything to do with health physical emotional spiritual um your romantic relationship is actually making you feel terrific on an emotional level and actually empowering you um but you're giving too many thoughts, too much thought. Here's where we're getting into trouble. Into, uh, it could be one of two things. So I'm going to have to ask you this and give me a yes or no answer. Are you currently in the process of moving or relocating? Our landlord is selling the building. Okay. We're not uh, sure. Yeah. All right. No, that's, 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 that. that, that that explains this for me so you're thinking about it way too much you're bending under all those thoughts about relocation and what it's doing is it's making you think the most negative possible way it's it's actually affecting you in a way that is contributing to yourself undoing you know if you imagine the worst case scenario enough it's going to happen you're going to create it to happen like we were talking before about as you see your world it becomes mm-hmm See your world not having that happen, and or if it is happening, and you being able to do it in a timely fashion, where you're not going to be negatively impacted. But what I'm feeling, and actually empathically, because of my connection to you, um, is really I'm feeling. I want to. I want to. I'm getting scared. I want to like hide. I want to make sure that nothing's going to harm me. So I'm already anticipating the worst case scenario. Try to work on that. Okay. Uh, because there's also landlord tenant laws. And they're always 90% on the side of the tenant, even if you're a bad tenant. Okay, so if they buy the house, they have to give you enough time to leave that is not going to create hardship. But I don't know about that. It says that um, also um, you're you're focused on the ability to be in control of finance. 
of what is valuable to you. Now, that could be two different things. It could literally be money because I have a queen of pentacles. Pentacles can either literally be money or what is valuable to you. And we just discussed an event that has you in a tailspin. So having a secure home might be the valuable thing. However, it says that if you continue tending to this, if you continue paying attention to this as diligently as you have, it will bring you reward. And you're going to realize that the only thing that was getting in your way was your own energy. So keep, just come back to who you are before she felt that she was under attack by this evil landlord who might be even better than the one that you have once they buy the house. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, right. So just keep, you know, come back to the empowered Janet that isn't flipping out about what might happen in the future. Wait until it does happen, then you can deal with it. And then move all that energy that's getting in your way away from your center. Uh, place it carefully in areas that need empowerment and strength and one of those is not imagining the worst case scenario <laughs> thank you anthony so that's um you know that's what i got out of that randy said you should be able to get a free court appointed attorney as well which in the event that worst case scenario yes. occurs you can you need one but what i've learned because when i first got sick i lost everything and they were evicting me every day every way they could I found that you're better off in landlord tenant court, pro se, you know, just being there, just having your documents ready and just being honest. And also a little trick, you can get up to 90 days by requesting an adjournment because everybody's going to need more time. That's but good to um, do you have a lease or are you on a month to month lease or? Month to month. All yeah. right. So then the new owner is then going to have to come up with another lease for you. It can either be month to month. It could be yearly. I mean, people make all kinds of leases for all kinds of times. Uh, so you don't know what's going to happen. It actually might work out better. That happened to me with my office in New Jersey. I was told that the guy that owns the building was like a motherfucker. And it turned out he's like one of the nicest people I've ever met. But I was loaded. I was ready for bear. I was ready yeah. to go to battle. Even Lena was going to come flying out of the garbage can with razor blades in her hair and knife in her <laughs> teeth and everything. And it turned out to be one of the nicest things that ever happened to me so it just seems that right now you're making yourself more frightened than you need to be and now we really gotta go thank uh, you because oh thank you sweetie we're we really have to go because we're an hour and a half in i hope that this was informative for everybody i hope that the front part of this uh live stream had so much information in it now, it's not going to be automatically simulcast to YouTube tonight because Scott isn't here to do it and I don't have his password, but it will be within the next 24 hours. And then um, you can go to Esoteric Guides TV on YouTube and you'll see, uh, thank you for the heart, Scott. It's very sweet of you. And then you'll be able to see, you'll be you just uh, subscribe to the channel and they'll let you know when the link has been uploaded but this was a really different live stream than i usually do and i wasn't sure even if i was going to like it um but i think i did i had a really good time tonight sharing that information and hopefully it was inspirational and healing so with that bye everybody love you all see you next week when i have no idea what the hell i'm going to be doing or who i'm going to be doing it with but you know it is going to be badass so i will see you then.